Hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Tarek Madini. I'm a partner in the fancy department of Further Partners in Berlin. I'm very happy um, to introduce to you um, our workshop on ILPA best practices in 2020. And um, it's a great honor and pleasure um, to welcome two representatives of the Institutional Limited Partner Association, ILPA, um, from Washington, DC, um, Chris Hayes and Neil Pronia. Chris is the Senior Policy Counsel at ILPA, and Neil Prunier is a director responsible for the standards and best practices of ILPA. And um, it's really my honor and great pleasure to work with Chris. Um, I have been in contact with him over phone and emails for many years, I think at least since mid-2017. We uh, exchanged views on the ILPA practices um, uh, in advance of uh, the development of ILPA Principles 3.0. And um, then I had finally earlier this year in uh, January 2020, I had the uh, pleasure to meet Chris um, at an event in Frankfurt where uh, I think it was the first time where ILPA was participating in a Germany based event. It was hosted by the Bundesverband uh, of the Institutionen um, Anleger, so the, the, the German Association of the Institution Investors. And um, yeah, it was a great pleasure to meet him there. And it would have been lovely to actually have him. Uh, in Munich, and uh, but um, now to the Corona pandemic, we are doing this virtually, and um, it works hopefully uh, seamless. And um, a warm welcome to Chris and Neil, and they will talk about the um, principles 3.0 um, as has been released by ILPA uh, back in June um, 2019. Um, also, the ILPA due diligence questionnaire, which is very important also for investors when they consider fund investments, and more importantly. Now, very current is the ILPA model LPA, which had been released in a version that was covering a um, whole of fund carried interest model. And now they um, are about to release over the summer a new version of it covering the deal by deal concept, which is more important for the US market, but nevertheless also sometimes seen here in Europe. And there are also plans um, to release a model on for European funds likely on a Luxembourg fund structure. And um, yeah, without further ado, enjoy the show. Great, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Hayes. Um, I'm the Senior Policy Counsel at the Institutional Limited Partners Association, and I lead our government affairs um, uh, work as well as our um, work on legal terms. Um, and joining me is my colleague, Neil. Neil, do you wanna introduce yourself? Thanks so much, Chris, and great to be here. I'm the Director of Standards and Best Practices at ILPA, um, and that title really accurately de uh, depicts what my responsibilities are. I have a variety of standards and best practices that we have out in the industry, as well as reviewing new areas for us to target. Great, thanks, Neil. Um, and just wanted to thank uh, Tarek Mardini and the folks at uh, PMP Poloth partners for having us uh, today um, to present on some of the issues that we're working on, particularly around principles 3.0, uh, the model LPA, our, our soon to be forthcoming DDQ and our uh, recently released subscription line guidance that Neil's gonna jump through. But first I wanted to talk a little bit about ILPA and in, in our organization. So ILPA is a trade association representing institutional limited partners uh, invested in private equity asset class. Um, you know, we do a variety of things for our members. Uh, first and foremost is standards and best practices that we release and put together with industry input from both GPs and LPs um, to try and advance uh, the private equity industry going forward. Um, and we'll be talking about some of those today. Um, next, we also advocate on behalf of our members, both uh, primarily in the US, um, UK, and in the European Union uh, around issues that impact uh, the private equity industry, including uh, some of the regulatory and registration requirements uh, in the US and in Europe. Um, third, we, we also have a robust educational offering to our members called the ILPA Institute, um, with a large number of modules that help our member LPs be better investors in the asset class. Um, and, and that program continues to grow um, with a variety of modules from portfolio construction to um, LPA terms to um, you know generally intro to PE courses. 
Uh, and lastly, we have a number of conferences and events where we encourage our members to not only meet with their peers, peer LPs, um, but also um, you know, meet with potential GPs that they might like to invest with. Neil, do you want to run us through some of the tools and templates uh, in our best practices program? Sure. And so one of the big areas for us to focus on is providing the industry with a variety of tools and templates to help increase the level of transparency and information flow between LPs and GPs. This is at the heart of what ILPA is and part of what we serve the industry. Um, these relate to our fee and reporting template, our DDQ, uh, the model LPA, portfolio company metrics, sublines guidance as well as GP led secondaries and as I mentioned before we are constantly reevaluating these to look at them to see if they are as up-to-date as possible as relevant as possible given changes in market environment and the nature of the industry as well as exploring different areas where there are current gaps in our tools and templates to make sure that we really are representing the LP community the best way possible thanks Dale just wanted to touch a little bit on ILPA's membership. Um, as I mentioned, uh, we represent institutional limited partners um, in a variety of different institutions on the limited partner side, including public and private pension plans, endowments and foundations, family offices, insurers, uh, developmental finance institutions, and uh, sovereign wealth funds. So uh, we have over 550 institutions that are members of the organization worldwide, uh, and we continue to grow. Um, and currently we have over 100 members in Europe, um, and we hope to continue adding more members there and, and delivering value to them um, as we continue to expand beyond North America. So Neil, do you wanna jump in and, and share a little bit about the ILPA principles, which is the first thing we're gonna talk about today? Sure, and, and the ILPA principles are really at the heart of a lot of the work that ILPA does, especially Chris and I within our um, within our work, they provide the, the driving force um, to really strengthen the conversations between LPs and GPs to help generate the best practices. And, and we're going to be talking about these terms a lot during the presentation today, but they're, they're built around the idea of alignment of interest, transparency, and governance. The principles first came out in September of 2009, um, and this was really driven by the great financial crisis and seeing some of the impact of the financial crisis and um, some of the challenges that the industry faced and that LPs in particular faced as far as information flow, uh, awareness, and interactions with their GPs. So this was a great opportunity to put the first principles out. Um, and since then, there's been an update in 2011 as well as 2019. Great, thanks, thanks, Neil. Um, just kind of moving on to to talk a little bit about what's new in 3.0. So, as Neil mentioned, you know there are kind of three main areas that we focus on um, in the principles, and those are alignment of interest, transparency, and governance, which we think are really core to the GPLP relationship. Um, you know, as you can see here in versions one and two, um, we covered a lot of various areas that were fundamental to the industry. But obviously, the industry has changed a lot since version 2.0 came out in 2011. Um, the industry is now regulated. Um, so that's been a significant change. Um, and we've seen a real evolution in the marketplace. Um, so in 3.0, we are taking things a step further, both to kind of cover new things and new trends in the market, whether it's co-investment um, or GP-led secondaries or the use of subscription lines um, or diving into ESG. Um, We've also focused a bit on um, the LPAC and the importance of having a stronger governance mechanism uh, and some of the challenges that exist around uh, LPACs today in the marketplace. Uh, and then also uh, looking a lot more closely at fiduciary obligations as we've seen some changes to those in the marketplace. Um, I think it's important to note with 3.0, we have done a change basically from what we've done in 1.0 and 2.0, whereas in those we had sought, actively sought endorsements from market participants. Um, at the time, we, we felt that to, to move these forward, we, we needed 
folks to endorse the principles, but unfortunately we found that that wasn't very meaningful. Um, many folks came out and I, I think we had over 300 endorsements of the principles, um, but some of those endorsements really just weren't that meaningful or it was difficult for us to really verify whether they were following the principles um, in their funds. Um, and we also feel that ILPA is at a stage where we can just put um, these principles out to the marketplace um, based on our viewpoint and that should be sufficient um, given we've seen adoption of a variety of other ILPA standards, most notably our fee template. Um, so in 3.0, as I mentioned, you know, we've, we've tried to evolve a bit for the market um, and really take a deeper dive than we've done in 2.0 and 1.0 to look at some of the issues uh, and provide a, a bit more clarity. Um, so for instance, we've done a lot more clarifying guidance around fund economics, um, around uh, key person provisions, um, really diving into the LPAC and, and what rights and obligations the LPAC should have to, to try and you know, put some clarity out to the market participants on what, what we think the LPAC should be doing. Um, and then you know, diving into kind of uh, new areas around fee and expense reporting or subscription lines or co-investment or GP LEDs, um, a variety of kind of new areas that we've done a deep dive on. We actually had some standalone guidance on GP LED secondaries as well as subscription lines, which Neil will talk uh, about an extension to that later. Um, but you know, fundamentally, all of these things are really about trying to have some stewardship in the industry and move the industry forward um, and, and just kind of put out something that's aspirational and not necessarily market conditions. Um, we think this is globally relevant and it, it should apply across the industry. Um, and, you know, we're hoping folks who are industry participants will look to these as a guide um, towards going further to, to you know, fulfill a, a long-term sustainable private equity industry. You know, I wanted to dive a little bit into some of the core ideas um, that we had mentioned before. And, and one of the most important and, and important to what ILPA is focused on is on alignment of interest. So, um, you know, I think our, our main focus here is that alignment, you know, GP alignment with the LP should really be driven by economics around um, receiving most of their um, compensation through carried interest. Um, so by focusing on being compensated through the profit share, um, you know, the GP is closely aligned with performance of the fund um, to help both the GP and the LP be successful in, in uh, maximizing fund performance. Um, we think if, if you're relying more on the management fee or other income streams such as you know fee income from portfolio companies, we think that's problematic because it really um, doesn't align the interest with maximizing the performance of the fund for the investors. And ultimately, I think our view from you know being an investor in the fund is that the GP should really be putting the, the investors ahead of themselves um, as you know that that's fundamental to the structure of the the industry that you know, LPs are giving capital to GPs to manage and they should be looking at what's best for the fund as opposed to what's best for the GP. Um, you know, we think there's a lot of things that should be done around conflicts to make sure it's very clear what conflicts of interest the manager has and that they're fully disclosed to LPs. Um, and then of course, any other kind of material benefits that GP is receiving, whether that, like I said, that's fee income or, um, you know, you know, uh, group purchasing uh, opportunities that are coming out of uh, affiliates of the GP or um, uh, any kind of other economic benefits the GP might be getting that, that touches alignment. For example, um, you know, having a stake in the GP being sold to someone else that's getting a fee stream. You know, how does that uh, impact alignment? So some of these elements are, we think, really fundamental to the GPLP relationship. Uh, the second item is really around transparency. and, and as, as Neil mentioned previously, uh, transparency is really critical to um, this industry, um, you know, particularly around fees and expenses. And, and I think we've seen that with some of the, the moves the SEC has done in the U.S., um, looking at improperly disclosed or inadequately disclosed fees and expenses, um, which, you know, we've responded to by issuing our fee reporting template. Um, we believe that in the principles, and, and we state this, that um, folks should be using the ILPA fee template. Um, we think it's 
uh, a great way to really be transparent about what fees and expenses are being charged and um, what the true economic costs of the investment are. Um, so that should be clear, complete, and not misleading. So, you know, LPs should be fully aware of what they're being charged to invest in the fund. Um, and they should also have relevant information about um, what's happening with the fund, what, what sort of investment strategy issues the, the GP might be facing, um, and, you know, what, you know, how is performance looking over time. Um, so they should have wide access to that kind of information about the GP and, and how the fund's being managed. Uh, and then lastly, we think fee and expense um, disclosures are, and carried interest disclosures should be subject to LP and independent auditor review and certification. So, so making sure that those are um, you know, accurate and uh, can be relied upon. So moving on to the last point, governance. So this is something we've been concerned about in terms of a, a trend in the marketplace um, where we, and this is probably more of a trend in North America, where we're seeing a real uh, reduction in the fiduciary duties that the manager owes to the fund. Um, and we've been pretty concerned about this. Uh, as I mentioned, we, we think it's really fundamental that the GP should be putting the interests of the fund ahead of their own. Um, and by reducing the fiduciary duty, um, you know, allowing the GP to work in their sole discretion, for example, is, is some of the language that's used, is really problematic because um, it, it disrupts alignment and it, it's, it's harmful to governance of the fund. And so, you know, we think it should be very clear and stated to investors that, that there be actually a standard of care um, that's, that's clear to investors what, what standard they're owed, um, whether it's negligence, gross negligence, um, from the GP um, so they know what to expect. Um, we think that they shouldn't be pre-clearing of conflicts. Um, that's something, um, you know, conflicts, uh, you know, if you shouldn't have vague language when you're entering into a fund to uh, have conflicts um, that aren't, can't be fully explained or understood be waived at the front end of the fund. We think when conflicts arise, they should be brought to the LPAC to be addressed. Uh, and then lastly, we think, you know, the LPAC's really fundamental. This is the closest thing to a board um, or a governance structure that a private equity fund has. And so we think the LPAC should be thoughtfully constructed with the right folks on it. Um, it should be clear about, you know, who who's on the LPAC, why, why they've been uh, included on the LPAC. Um, however, you know, we still think it's important that um, LP serving on the LPAC should not be fiduciaries of the fund. But we think LP, uh, LPAC members should be doing more when they're on the fund. So they should be have minimum participation standards and they should be required to, um, you know, actually opine and act as a governance mechanism. Um, we've been concerned about some of the trends where we, we hear that LPs aren't aren't willing to um, take a stance on, on issues that are core to all the other investors in the fund. Uh, we also think the LPAC should have access to um, advisors and kind of outside um, resources uh, and information um, to be able to do their job properly. Um, and they should be able to meet in camera without the GP there to have some discussions uh, about the direction of the fund to really ser truly serve in that governance mechanism. So. You know, these are just a few uh, items that we, you know, considered um, as part of Principles 3.0, but they were not included. Um, one of those was uh, around organizational costs. I think, you know, there's been some trepidation in the industry about the fact that um, LPs pay the costs of the fund formation um, and effectively for the lawyers to negotiate the document against them. Um, we, we didn't decide to go that far this year, um, sorry, last year when we released Principles 3.0, but it's something that um, we're continuing to keep an eye on as organizational costs grow in the industry. Um, we looked at the idea of potentially requiring expense ratios. Uh, and we think we found that potentially a little unwieldy. Um, and then we looked at um, the idea of independent directors, kind of what you see with registered funds or USITs, um, where, you know, you know, looking at something that's a little bit more of a formal mechanism for governance beyond the LPAC. Um, you know, and, and there are some other items here that we've also potentially considered, but we're not included in 3.0. I um, want to pass it over to talk about, you know, now that we've gone through kind of what was in the principles 3.0, 
want to pass it over to Neil to talk a little bit about um, the due diligence questionnaire, which um, is is one of our other best practices uh, material. Great, thanks, Neil? Chris. Yeah. Um, so as mentioned before, principles really do serve as a guiding light for much of the work we do here at OPA. Um, at times, they can be lofty and an ideas in the sky, and so the DDQ really helps ground the principles by asking questions that promote and seek to better understand the themes of alignment of interest, governance, and transparency. Uh, the first version of our DDQ was released in 2013, and since then it's been updated in 2016 and 2018. Um, in 2016, the update really focused on enhancements around ESG, uh, and in 2018, really focused on enhancements around DNI. So why use the ILPA DDQ and what value does it provide? Well, with any standardization effort, a major part is increasing efficiencies by reducing the number of ad hoc customized requests. The DDQ seeks to minimize administrative burden on LPs and GPs by standardizing key points for the DDQ and replacing the need for each LP to create a custom DDQ. Uh, one issue when LPs do create custom DDQs beyond just the time intensive nature of it, that LPs aren't aware of what other LPs are asking for, and more importantly, what other LPs are receiving. The ILPA DDQ seeks to reduce information asymmetry to, take in, to make information more consistent across LPs. And when information is more consistent and more easily provided, that allows both LPs and GPs to repurpose, repurpose their time towards more value-add activities such as analysis, Next slide, Chris. So there's a variety of topics that are currently covered in the DDQ. So I'm not gonna read through all of these, um, but the foundation of the DDQ is to really give the LPs and the prospective investors in the fund the clear understanding of what they would be entering into uh, for what is at times a 10 plus year relationship. So, Last slide covered the topics that are already in the DDQ, and as Chris mentioned, we're going to be working on an update to the DDQ uh, scheduled for release this year in 2020. Um, so there are some key topics that we want to expand upon uh, in the updated DDQ, including sublines, co-investments, and fiduciary duty. Additionally, there's a number of ODD, so operational due diligence specific items, um, that aren't covered in full in the current version. Um, many of these items were already on our radar to prioritize, but realistically, COVID-19 has placed an increased emphasis on these topics. So the idea of cybersecurity, business continuity plans, and succession planning, those have all been topics that have come up at length during the last several months as LPs are looking to gain a better understanding of how their GPs are operating during these times, we want our DDQ to be able to give the LPs that understanding before they even invest in a fund. Um, and then we're also looking to create strategy specific points or, or essentially modules for specific strategies to cover topics that are unique within those areas. So the, the four big strategies that we're targeting here are venture capital, private credit, real estate, and infrastructure. All right, great. So. Uh, Next topic that we're going to touch on are the subscription lines of guidance. Um, at the time of the recording on June 11th, this is actually the day after uh, we put out our follow-on guidance. So this is really near and dear right now and, and top of mind. Um, our subscription line guidance was initially put out in 2017. Um, and really what we wanted to focus on there, given how much subscription lines had become commonplace, over the past decade, especially as interest rates dropped significantly, we really wanted to educate LPs and the industry as a whole on what was happening with sublines and the impact they have. Sublines can in fact be very beneficial. They can help smooth operations with cash flows, they can reduce the number of capital calls, and they can help with the rebalancing efforts. However, sublines can also be abused for the purpose of inflating IRR, and there's often lacking information and disclosures between GPs and LPs on the sublines that are in use. So we really wanted to create um, a method and an avenue to improve some of these issues. 
So 2017, as mentioned, really focused on education, um, really placing an emphasis on the parameters for use of the sublines to prevent some of that abuse from taking place, as well as basic recommendations for disclosures. Um, the guidance that was just released goes a step further in terms of the detail and the amount of recommendations for quarterly and annual disclosures to improve the transparency and information sharing, as well as a request for enhanced predictability where possible on capital calls, um, both in terms of timing and amount. And this is really in instances where the size of the capital call passes a certain threshold. What we've outlined in our updated guidance is if a capital call passes beyond 20 to 25%, um, we really like to see GPs providing more than the standard 10-day notice to LPs. So we mentioned before just the impact of subscription lines and how it can be abused. And I think these two charts really give a great insight and a great picture of that. Um, you really see the greatest impact of subscription lines on IRR in the early stages of the fund. And that is because GPs are using subscription lines to delay calling capital. And just based off of how IRR is calculated, that is going to increase IRR when capital is not being called and rather you're using a subscription line. So as you can see in a one year subscription line of credit, uh, the IRR with the subscription line is 18%. Without the subscription line, that IRR goes down to 14%. Um, you also see a change in the MOIC, um, and you'll typically see that actually go up when a subscription line is in use. Um, with a two-year subscription line, so whenever the subscription line is used in an even longer period, um, and pushes out capital calls that much further, you've seen even greater impact on IRR. So again, without the subscription line, the IRR is 14%, but with a two-year subscription line, that increases all the way up to 26%. And here in instances, the manager has done nothing different. They've made the same investments, um, they've used the same skill, however, we see a substantial increase mathematically in IRR, which then can impact when carried interest comes into play, which then financially impacts LPs. We really wanna promote an environment where the use of subscription lines solely to impact IRR and keeping subscription lines out for an even further amount of time to impact IRR is not commonplace practice. As mentioned, um, we really focused on the disclosures on a quarterly and annual basis in the updated subscription line guidance. And what you see here on the screen are the, the recommended disclosures that we've asked for. Um, in some cases, GPs are already providing this to LPs, but it's not consistent and it hasn't been standardized. Uh, we also see in many cases, LPs are going out to their GPs on a quarterly basis and asking for this information. So what we're seeking to do is to help promote greater flow of information in a consistent way, thus making it easier on GPs to provide this information and making LPs more aware of the situation. Another impact of subscription lines is that LPs don't necessarily know their full exposure because of the amount of unfunded commitment that they have um, out on the subscription line. So for example, you might think across a particular uh, or across your entire portfolio, you have 18% exposure to private equity. But when you factor in all the money that you have um, tied up in the subscription line, in essence, that could go up to 20, 22, even 23 or 24%. Um, and that's not necessarily a good thing, especially in instances when you have a policy limit on the amount of private equity exposure. So what we're really trying to do with this different disclosures is help LPs really understand the impact of the sublines across their overall exposure and across performance, as well as the key terms and costs and fees associated with the sublines. Especially now that they are common practice and essentially every fund is gonna have a subscription line almost. 
we want LPs to have a, a clear understanding of how it impacts them day in and day out and over the life of their investment. And now, Chris, over to you to dive into the model LPA. Thanks, Neil. Um, that was really helpful. I think it was a real robust uh, overview of what we're trying to do on subscription lines. Um, and, you know, just want to jump into the model LPA as we continue to talk about some of the various best practices materials uh, we've put out over the past year or two. Um, so the IPA model LPA um, is the first um, publicly available free to use limited partnership agreement that's been introduced to the private equity market. Um, we released this last fall um, after about a year and a half of a number of attorneys working on this project. Um, and we actually expect to release a, a version with some, some minor updates um, next month in July, 2020, um, along with a separate version with a different waterfall type and a, a summary term sheet that covers some of the specifics of what's in the, the actual document. Um, the reason why we did this project was that we have been really engaged on LPA terms, but we didn't, um, you know, the ILPA principles talked about these things anecdotally, but didn't have technical language that could actually be used in negotiation. Um, and, you know, we, we think it was really important to continue the conversation in, in the public domain about what is actually in these uh, lengthy contracts um, and what sort of terms are out there and what's, what's expected uh, in, in terms of what's market. Um, and by putting out a public document, we thought this really democrat, democratizes access to a document that's generally covered by a non-disclosure agreement. Um, so, you know, folks in this market, as, as I'm sure I don't have to tell you, you're all really um, operating in a market that's um, under confidentiality, um, which makes you have to rely on either seeing a lot of documents to know what's market in terms of the LPA terms you're agreeing to, or um, relying on counsel that sees a lot of documents. Um, and so we thought it was really important to put out a document that we thought aligned with our principles, but that was as fair and market friendly as it could be um, to be useful to the industry. And we think it can be used in a variety of ways. Um, you know, one of the first touch on some of the folks that were involved with drafting this group. So we had a, a, a large group of internal and external counsel, um, both representing GPs and LPs, um, and kind of a, a global perspective with European. Um, and North American uh, attorneys involved. Um, so we, we really gathered their expertise in this project um, to, to run through and create a document that we think uh, is fair and balanced and as market friendly as it could be. Um, so we're really relying on their expertise um, in terms of what we put out to the marketplace. So first I wanna talk a little bit about the LPA and how we think it'll be useful. I think there's a decent amount of skepticism in the market, um, and not only from our own members, when we first um, talked about doing this project, um, given that LPA is usually drafted by a law firm, but you know, we think this LPA can be used in a variety of ways and actually be really useful in uh, informing folks in the market about terms and also providing a tool for LPs and GPs to use in a variety of ways. So, Thinking about it from the LP perspective, why is the model LPA useful? First, we think it can be used as a core negotiation tool with established managers. Um, you know, many times we hear from our member LPs that they are looking for specific language that they can suggest or even potentially include in the side letter um, to address some of the challenges they're facing um, or to implement the actual ILPA principles, um, which doesn't actually have the technical language in it. Um, to, um, to effectively insert into an actual limited partnership agreement. And so we think, you know, while we're realistic about large established managers adopting this document, we think it can be used in the course of negotiation because all the parties, given that this is a publicly available document, should be familiar with its provisions. Um, and when LPs, um, you know, can refer to it um, in negotiation, um, everybody would be aware of what what those terms are and what they mean. Um, and it, it may be a good compromise point for both parties to, to insert particular provisions from the LPA uh, into another document. Um, 
Second, we think it can be really useful as a benchmarking tool for LPs. So LPs can look at the ILPA LPA and be comforted that, you know, the terms are fair and reasonable to them um, and look at that and compare kind of the other LPAs they're seeing in the marketplace um, to this document and what those terms look like um, as a helpful tool about benchmarking what um, either new fund docs that they're seeing look like as well as existing ones and how they compare to what ILPA has produced. Um, third, we think this can be really useful to LP emerging manager programs. So a number of LPs have programs where they seed or invest in, in newer or emerging managers. Um, and we, we, we hope that, and we are talking to some of them about encouraging adoption of this um, for managers that are coming out and applying to those programs that they, they use the ILPA LPA as a starting point. Lastly, um, as I mentioned before, ILPA has an extensive educational platform called the ILPA Institute. Uh, and we think this LPA can be really useful as a training aid uh, about what sort of terms are out there in the marketplace uh, and, and you know, what, you know, what, what, what they should be asking for in these documents when they negotiate. I want to move on next to what the GPs um, may want to look to in the model LPA and how it might be useful to them. First, you know, if you're a GP um, and you're looking to have an LP friendly fundraise um, and start out strong, this is a great document for you. Um, so starting with this document and being able to tell your LPs that, look, we, we used a lot of either the, the ILPA model LP as a starting point or a lot of um, provisions from the LPA or, or specific provisions from the ILPA model LPA, um, you know, that, that's a brand that I think LPs will recognize as something that's positive for them. Um, and it can eliminate potentially some friction in the fundraising process um, when folks are negotiating the limited partnership agreement. Uh, secondly, uh, building on that, it's particularly useful for emerging managers who want to attract that LP capital and be very friendly to LPs that are looking for a fair document that they know what they're getting. Um, so if you're an emerging manager, you can pick up this document, um, as well as a variety of ILPA materials that we're, we're actually going to be putting them in place, um, kind of documents in a box um, with a variety of, of ILPA model documents for new managers that want to um, attract LP capital, you know, you can pick up this LPA and use it as a starting point, uh, work with your external counsel, potentially reduce some of your costs, um, and then, uh, you know, put that out to, to folks that LPs that you're talking to about investing in your fund. Um, third, we, we think just by putting this document out in the public realm is really valuable in itself. Um, it's market signaling of what LPs are looking for, what LPs think are fair. Um, and so, you know, being able to look at this should help guide um, GPs about what LPs are looking for. Um, so it's valuable to them in that regard. Um, and, and we've heard that from some of the commentary that we've received on this LPA. A number of law firms have looked at this document and done some client alerts on it, um, which indicates the relevance of it to the market. Um, lastly, um, reduction of side letter negotiation. So a, a common concern of GPs is the cost in time it takes to negotiate side letters. Um, what we've tried to do is include as many things that would potentially be in a side letter in the LPA. So first of all, they apply to everybody in the fund um, if, if they're not just something specific to a particular investor or around a regulatory requirement, et cetera. But you know, hopefully by including some of these provisions in the LPA, you're reducing the length of these side letters and also the time and cost it takes to negotiate them. Um, so we think that's a value there as well. So I wanted to move on and talk a little bit about some of the specific terms in this LPA. So uh, this initial version um, is um, what we're referring to as version 1.0. In July, we'll be releasing version 2.0, which has a different waterfall structure. Um, we're also considering something that is specifically tailored to the European market um, with um, tying it to probably a Luxembourg do domicile to, to be that are aligned with the European market. Um, but um, initially these documents do align to uh, a Delaware legal framework um, just for our two initial LPA documents that they we're releasing, but we're certainly considering expanding it. Um, so the initial LPA version 1.0 
has a European Holofun waterfall. Um, this aligns with the ILPA principles. Um, it limits LP clawback risk. Um, and you know, we, we think it's, it's a fundamental way um, to ensure that um, the distributions uh, flow appropriately to LPs and GPs, and there's uh, a sufficient alignment between GPs and LPs. Um, we include a preferred return. Um, we bracket an 8%, which we think is pretty much industry standard, and some of our uh, recent surveying indicates that the preferred return hurdle is pretty set around 8%. Um, we also include some uh, a, a GP final and interim GP clawback. Um, and the interim clawback is one year after the commitment period. Um, and we've also provided some protection in, in the case of optional escrow provisions. And of course, those are bracketed and they don't necessarily have to be used, but we wanted to provide that option that's out there. Um, and you know, one of the things that we clarified around the preferred return was that if a subline is used, uh, the preferred return should run when the line is drawn. Um, so when the LP capital is risked, not not when a capital call is made, um, because that that wouldn't wouldn't be appropriate. Um, and so, like I said, we were going to be uh, coming out with a deal by deal North American style waterfall version um, as part of version 2.0. So that will provide more flexibility for GPs that may want to adopt the document, um, depending on what waterfall structure they're choosing. Um, and so, you know. Fundamentally, the goal here was to create something that's flexible for different GPs and fund strategies by bracketing a significant amount of the language in the LPA um, so that folks can adjust it based on what terms they'd like to have in there, but providing the various options. So moving on to, to fees and expenses. Um, so, you know, I think we've basically clarified um, what expenses we think should be allocated to the GP as well as the LP. For example, we think the GP should pay for internal legal and accounting costs that are billed to the LP or pay for their own registration or regulatory costs under AFMD or the SEC registration regime. Um, we, we carve out private jet travel um, and you know, we include an organizational expense cap, um, but it's bracketed up to a percentage of lower than aggregate commitments. Um, so, you know. We've tried to make it more clear um, as we try to do uh, in a variety of other ways with our reporting template, et cetera, about what fees and expenses uh, are being charged to the fund and which are covered by the GP. Um, just to make sure that's very clear um, and it's, it's effectively delineated. And of course, the document is flexible to, to be changed based on, on the particular dynamics of that fund. Uh, Moving on to fiduciary duty, indemnification, and exculpation. Um, we do take a non-traditional view here, given that I mentioned earlier we're concerned about reductions of fiduciary duty. Um, we've uh, put in an ordinary prudent person standard of care, um, which is a little atypical, but we think it's really important that the manager, like I said uh, in the principles, affirmatively states what their standards of care is. Um, and make sure that the fund's interest is put ahead of the, the GP's interest. Um, we prevent the disclaiming of fiduciary duty or the use of sole discretion by the GP. Um, and you know, we exclude coverage in the indemnification provision if the GP breaches the LPA, which I think is also kind of a unique provision. Um, but other than that, um, we... Um, generally have very similar elements that would be in a traditional uh, LPA around fiduciary duty and indemnification and exculpation, but we're just trying to address some of the challenges we've seen in the marketplace. Moving on to the LPAC. So as I mentioned in Principles 3.0, we've been a little bit more clear about the role of the LPAC and in, in that um, we think the LPAC should have certain rights and obligations. And we've tried to implement that into the LPA. So we provide for in-camera meetings uh, without the GP present of the LPAC. The LPAC has the ability to hire advisors to fully understand issues, whether it's legal or, or um, auditors. Um, it also is covered and indemnified um, or, and also has DNI insurance. Um, and then a variety of other elements and requirements 
to seek LPAC approval, um, notably around changes of control, um, conflicts of interest, uh, fund termination, and suspension of the commitment period. And I wanted to move on and touch a little bit about key person and removal. Um, you know, we've inserted a no fault and a four cause removal into this document. Um, the four cause removal um, requires a majority vote of the LPs. Um, as we know, it's very rare for a manager to be removed for cause. Um, but if it's something that's for cause, it's probably pretty significant. And in that case, we've recommended a 100% haircut on carried interest to the GP um, and no additional management fees. The no fault removal, um, we require a 75% vote of LPs in the fund, which um, we think is pretty close to market, um, but also um, a potential haircut on the carried interest of the GP. Although we have bracketed that so that folks can um, utilize that or not. Um, it's just something that you know, we think that you know, carry should be, uh, if, you're, if you're removing the manager, um, there should be some sort of haircut on carry. Um, and then key person events, right? So um, when you have key person event, it would trigger an automatic suspension of the commitment period and then an automatic termination of the commitment period if the LPs do not approve a remediation period uh, plan within a state period. So um, that gives some time to you know, prevent anything from happening and allows the LPAC to get together um, and look at some sort of remediation plan um, and, and forces the LPs to act to, to address uh, the key person events. Um, lastly, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, some of the things around LP communications. We obviously care quite a bit about LPs being able to communicate with their peers. Um, so this will permit certain disclosures um, to other LPs, um, communication with the other LPs of the fund to exercise their rights under the LPA, and then also a requirement that a register of all the LPs in the fund be provided quarterly to all of the, uh, the LPs in the fund, um, just so they know who their peer LPs are in the fund. Um, in order to exercise some, some of the fund governance uh, requirements in the LPA. So um, with that, I would, you know, both Neil and I uh, would like to thank everyone for taking the time to, to learn about some of the things that ILPA has been working on. Um, and we're happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, and feel free to just email us at the emails below. Um, and with that, um, thanks again. Thank <laughs> you.